afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome to another exciting propaganda cast layer, and thus also instructional. Here with me, your host, Imperial Dane, Master of Instruction. And we're going to be having a look at anti-tank guns in general, sort of more anti-tank gun theory. How do you get the most out of your anti-tank gun in any match? How do you sort of ensure they don't get completely annihilated? And of course, I mean, that regard, you'll also sort of subtly learn, you know, the weaknesses of the anti-tank guns, for example, how to deal with them and how, for example, not to deal around them. So, anti-tank guns. I mean, all really sort of, one thing to also maybe all the answers, you know, when's a good time to get an anti-tank? And of course, I mean, that guy, you're going to have to sort of do some readings on your opponent. Some players like to rush. Some, of course, there's still a mesa game sort of waiting longer for sort of call-in arms or something like that. Generally, having a single anti-tank gun, no matter what side you're on, around the 10-minute mark, unless you order yourself have rushed for armor, is generally not a half-bad idea. I mean, that pretty much would cut off most sort of attempts sort of getting armor and doing any sort of serious damage with it. Of course, with lighter vehicles, like say from the Americans, of course, I mean, you're probably going to take it out pack 40, but even then, versus some of them, pack 40 might not quite be the exact solution you're looking for. And already here, we're coming to something about the anti-tank guns. Anti-tank guns, while mobile, are not the most mobile thing. And they are, more specifically, they're not very good at reacting to threats. They're very much better sort of acting than reacting due to sort of their cumbersome nature. So that is already there, something to keep in mind while using the pack 40. I mean, it's not really something you want to sort of, okay, I'm being attacked here, then I'll rush in the pack 40. That's not necessarily the best option. Of course, it's going to be exception. Of course, I'll explain a bit further in detail later on, but overall, the general rule of thumb, when it comes down to tank guns, you sort of want to prepare positions for them ahead of time. You want to sort of figure out where's my opponent most likely to appear with a tank or a vehicle, and then sort of have the anti-tank gun ready. So that's already there. One important detail, sort of keep in mind with the anti-tank guns, there's sort of more weapons you sort of use to deny territory or sort of deal with things, or if you have to sort of use them in a more active position, you use them because you want to deal with something more specifically already as part of a plan. Otherwise, I mean, they do tend to sort of not be that strong. I mean, again, note here, they do take quite a bit of time there, sort of swing around and all that. So there are some details there to keep in mind. Of course, other things are sort of important for them, as you might notice here. Anti-tank guns, most of them, except for the Kedden Effer, have quite a bit of range. The American anti-tank gun with veterans one, by the way, its ability can gain even more range, but overall, this is sort of the general range. Of course, they can't see all the way, except for the American one, and the third one, also with veterans one abilities, they can actually see a bit farther, but overall, this sort of means, you know, for example, to get the most out of the anti-tank guns, you usually need someone to spot for them. That can be a vehicle, usually some infantry. Generally having infantry alter service or spotter alter service another important purpose and that's screening the anti-tank guns because anti-tank guns are very vulnerable to infantry. And one of the sort of more direct counters to an anti-tank of course is rushing it with infantry. So unless you've got something screening it or something else covering it, your anti-tank gun can very easily be knocked out. So already there for example, learning how to, you know, use your anti-tank gun Supporting infantry, for example, is a good trick. I mean, that's also some more safe way of using it a bit more actively. You have the infantry move ahead, anti-tank gun covers. And generally, that's all sort of the best position of having your anti-tank gun, for example, on the defense. You've got the infantry at the front, and the anti-tank gun sort of covers reasonably a bit away. Not too far away, though, because otherwise the anti-tank can, for example, safely fire away at your infantry. You want sort of a good distance, but still not too much either. That way, also, if your opponent tries to rush the anti-tank gun, you can usually, if you've got the right infantry, also then damage the engine of the tank and that way being more easy to deal with. And that of course is another reason you want sort of infantry like Kennedy is rifling with rifle grenades and so on to sort of cover it that way because that also serves as sort of another threat towards rushing because even more fun fact, a single medium tank can, under the right circumstances, you know, if your anti tank gun is under completely alone, rush it, get behind and completely clear it out. So in that regard, an anti tank gun is not a single weapon. It's not a tank it's very much a support weapon in every sense of the word. It's there to support others. It does not fare well on its own. A pair of packs, of course, much more a threat, but even then, we're talking plural. No longer a single anti-tank gun, and that's also a larger investment, but it's also one a single infantry squad can, for example, easily deal with. So there are a lot of these details to keep in mind already when it comes to, you know, dealing with anti-tank guns. And these more or less apply to most, of course, the Kedden Fs, of course, have a much harder time, of course, initially due to sort of, you know, shorter range, of course. The cloaking sort of helps a bit since they gain that quickly, and of course, the veterans, they do gain more experience. So those are some things here to sort of keep in mind. And while we're at it here, of course, here's a sort of another good lesson with your anti-tank guns. Keep the arc of fire in mind. Generally, as much as possible, you don't want anything blocking it. I mean, the more that blocks your anti-tank guns arc of fire, 
the less it's worth and the more easily your entire tank gun can be counted. So also try to keep terrain in mind when you're setting it up. For example, nice open territory here. Good spot for an anti-tank gun, for example, or so on here. Of course, you also have to sort of take in mind, you know, where your opponent more likely to strike you. And of course, it also depends on your position of the rest of your army, and so on. So, of course, I mean, that guy, of course, you, those are skills you have to acquire. So, of course, a sort of tactical understanding. But overall, you sort of keep those in mind. You should overall sort of learn your way quickly towards where to set up your anti-tank guns the best. And of course, overall sort of covering the center, overall good idea. If you have several anti-tank guns, a good way is actually, in fact, to keep them spread apart. Otherwise, they can easily be outmaneuvered. For example, two at a tank that's right around here. One tank arrives, drive around them, and they're useless and easily dealt with. So you usually also keep some, you know, spacing apart them. If you've got to sort of cover sort of angst, also again, say for example, anti tank and covering here, then you know, and you want the other one to sort of cover here. Try to sort of set it up so, for example, if you know the one around here gets attacked, the other one can easily cover it, and vice versa. I mean, in that regard usually sort of want, you know, mutual coverage and a bit of sort of defense in depth so that way, you know, if one ends up taking in trouble, the other one can easily cover in case it's an armored threat. So over here there's a bit more of an advanced theory and tactics, if you will, when it comes to those anti-tank guns. I mean, there's sort of a lot of things there to keep in mind with them. A lot of things. But overall, you sort of want to sort of set up sort of the area where you very much is most expecting your opponent to move about. And again, to attack, of course, that way, you know, again, you might say, well, what about flanks and so on? Again, that's where I sort of try to cover with infantry and so on, but also mines. I mean, mines are very good, important thing that sort of cover up with flanks, for example. Also, your opponents more likely to sort of, you know, not be prepared for it. So, quick that, that way you can also, for example, then quick turn the anti tank gun and deal with it. It's not a bad idea either to, for example, have mines in front of the anti tank gun. For example, again, if your opponent gets sort of disrupted, that's great. Because overall, if you can sort of damage the engine of any vehicle in front of your tank, uh, anti-tank gun, that's great! Because that gives your anti-tank gun a much better chance of wiping it out, which is overall what you want. So mines, for example, are great, so sort of, you know, combine the anti-tank gun with as well, panzer fast and so on, but mines, particularly the ones you can actually fully immobilize a vehicle, are great stuff. So sort of try to combine those two, and usually you get a lot more out of your anti-tank guns as well. So that's also a little detail there to keep in mind. Now here we have the exact sort of bad positioning I was talking about. I mean here consider for example this very close together, very close together. I mean again one tank drives past them, both screwed. I mean here there's a bit of sort of terrain to sort of make it a bit easy. And of course we've got this current getting in then. And that could easily be end up being a very, very bad position. Of course it also has another problem. It's all sort of far away and again it's sort of on the ankles and again we save your tech elsewhere. Again, there's going to be a long time reaction. Of course, in that guy, there's also important thing to keep in mind. The anti again, they are slow to move. You can't really have them as reactive force again. You sort of got to sort of guess where's my opponent most likely to strike and then sort of try to set up their prediction. I mean, that guard, the anti tank again, is a much more predictive weapon, a much more prepared weapon, rather than reactive weapon. It's not a tank, it's not a tank destroyer as such. Of course, I mean, technically, the word described as tank destroyers by well, the Americans and the Germans, but you know, you get the point. They're not self propelled. And overall, they're slow and they're cumbersome, which overall limits the usability. Also, a good thing to do, prioritize vehicles. You don't want them, you know, blasting away infantry, sort of, you know, giving away their secret. So that's also a very important thing to be mind with anti tank. It's also, you know, that. But otherwise, you know, okay, so also consider shifting the positions about. Another important thing is actually also talking about here is veterancy, more specifically, veterancy preservation. That's actually something a lot of players neglect. But overall, you want to heal your anti tank gun crews, you want to reinforce them, and you also want to repair them. Keep them maintained at all positions, particularly again more veterancy because veterancy on your anti tank guns is absolute gold. They become much more powerful as they gain more experience, like Ked Methods, Pack 40s, Field Guns, M1s. They all become much better with veterancy. Part because of ability, which again is something people neglect. I mean, they're all great, use them properly, and you can do a lot. Target weak point, for example, is great for sort of, you know, gaining an hedge up and basically denying a vehicle the chance to escape, which case, you know, great stuff. American ones can, for example, see farther, which overall gives a lot more potency, also makes it harder for the enemies to escape if they're handled correctly. So it's one can also see farther, which again gives them a bit more then, also allows them to stay a bit further close to the anti tank gun. I can never don't, but on the other hand, they have so many more levels of veterans that they can overall gain a lot more punch, and ultimately, they also gain more range. So when you can keep those things again and try to use the abilities if possible and again you'll gain a lot more out of them. And again if you gain more experience on them they will do a lot better. I mean really they do a lot better all of them. So try to do that. I mean if you can get that good experience on the anti tank guns they'll do much much better for you and they'll make things much more miserable for your opponent. 
So that's actually quite vital to keep in mind. But overall, what we're seeing here in that guy from this play is basically more reactor plan. I mean, he's constantly sort of rushing to sort of deal with the tank. And then he forgets about it. He does sort of try to prepare. And he apparently expects you know, his opponent sort of attack from here, particularly after he sort of shoots away. So, I mean, overall, poor anti-tank and positioning here. And overall, something I would suggest most players don't try for. I mean, this is sort of, you know, I want to hunt the bastards down, which again is great, but that you know, requires you to be on the offense. Which again, this player clearly isn't. So, I mean, if you can overall try and keep those things in mind again, you do much better with your anti tank guns and, well, you know, if you're wasting, then you're also doing more harm to your opponent's tanks, which again is rather what you want to do. <coughs> and again, here, march to close again. It seems to be a bit more, you know, the protective. Well, I expect my opponent to come here, but there's also another problem. In part, he ignored the recons, but again, they're very much, you know, with their eyes. And again, there's a huge flank here open up. And again, note how they're positioned. Again, this is what we're talking about. I mean, it's complete chaos here. Easily dealt with, without even being able to fire off a shot. So, I mean, very much, they're not something that should be on their own. Very much not something that should be on their own. They have, in many regards, several vulnerabilities which do require their very much part of force. They are very much support weapons, which means they support, but they cannot survive on their own. So keep that in mind with them. And of course, here we can always sort of discuss nothing, you know. When should we recruit and when shouldn't you? I mean, overall, if it's a back 40, always recruit. Always. Pretty much. I mean, unless you've got some very specific plans for the population all that, you know, you can wreck it, but otherwise, you know, try to otherwise deny, deny it to your opponent. Overall, you should always try to deny your opponent and to tank and to somehow see them. If you're no use from the course, wreck them. But even if you say, you know, depending on the situation, you might even be forced to grab them because even then, you know, being able to give your own tanks more freedom is valuable. Even if that means, you know, grabbing an anti-tank and you essentially don't need. I mean, if you can show your opponent has nothing to defend off your tanks with, that's also pretty damn good. So that's actually also important to keep in mind. But overall, you know, try to grab them, and in particular if you don't have anyone grabbing an enemy is also a great start off to sort of, you know, your own anti-tank adventures. But again, when it comes to the pack 40, always grab them. I mean, it's pretty much the sort of straight up best up. I mean, the M1's also pretty good in some ways, so it's the CIS and so on, but certainly the pack 40 is the more straightforward best. And certainly also on the target weak point, which again is an ability much neglected. So I mean, if you can sort of keep those things in mind again, all those, you know, positioning, trying to sort of be ahead of your opponent when it comes to setting him up, spacing, being mindful of the terrain, again, also be sure there's no sort of easy path to flank it, setting up sort of flank coverage, screening, all that. I mean, it sure does sound a lot, but again, when you do sort of set them up and then combine it all properly, they do become a lot more powerful. They're very much a force multiplier. So, I mean, if you can use them properly, you can do a lot more harm to your opponent than they could sort of on their own, and you can also keep your opponent a lot more defensive on the back foot with his armor. So that's very much sort of a thing to keep in mind. Of course, the reverse more or less applies to all sort of tankers and such to want to deal with them. And there's also little weaknesses there to sort of try and take advantage of, and of course things to be wary of. I mean, you can overall do that, you should overall perform much better with them, and probably against them as well if you know what you're doing. So I think that sort of largely covers the basics here of and tight tank gunning and fighting versus enemy armor. And hopefully with this little propaganda cast left, people should have a much stronger idea sort of dealing with tanks using the anti-tank guns and how sort of, you know, to keep them at most levels of veterancy without getting wasted in senseless manners. So hopefully you've all learned something from this. Hopefully this has gained you much wisdom and knowledge. If you did, why not subscribe, tell your friends, share it with everyone. This is Imperial Dang Ching. Cheers and thank you all for watching. Bye.